So in case you uh, needed any proof about why Martin Wolf is the chief economics course uh, commentator for the Financial Times, I think the uh, last 30 minutes has, uh, has uh, proven his case. That is the absolutely the most lucid uh, description and analysis of the crisis that, that I have heard. Um, I'm joined by Ed Keane of the Observatory Group and the National Economist Club. And uh, Ed, why don't you start us off with the question and answers, and then we'll open it up to the, uh, the audience. So uh, Martin, I was very intrigued by the point you made in your talk about uh, the potential or the need for Germany and, and the Netherlands to accept higher inflation rates. I'm wondering, in the, particularly in the case of Germany, if you could talk about the extent to which you think the German political leadership, as well as the uh, notoriously uh, inflation adverse German population, will be willing to accept such an outcome. I think it's one of the most interesting questions. Uh, there's actually a little wrinkle there. There's a, uh, one question is whether they can prevent it. Uh, and I'll come to that. Um, I had a conversation about four years ago with a very distinguished German official who has since left the European Central Bank's board and whose name I will not mention. Uh, <laughs> And which I said, given where you are, this is four years ago, given where you are now it, and what has happened in the last decade, it is obviously we're going to, that we're going to have a period when this will, must be to some degree unwound. And that will mean, given the target for inflation that you have in Germany, in the ECB, of which is less than 2% or close to 2%, um, it's never been entirely clear what the target is. They, they have clarified a bit. Let's say it's 2%, that you will have to accept for a long period uh, uh, an inflation rate in Germany which is higher than that target and his response was that is absolutely unacceptable and then I said in that case this is not a currency union and uh, so th there is clearly a lot of resistance among some people to this notion um, however it is important to note that I did this figure you may well know it that if you actually looked at the actual average inflation rate achieved under the Bundesbank in its many decades of um, overseeing German inflation, it actually averaged 3%. So uh, there wouldn't be anything terribly ca catastrophic if it were at that sort of level, or even, I think, a bit higher. So there's a political sensitivity issue, uh, uh, yes, uh, and of course it's become greater now, but a somewhat higher inflation rate than 2% would not be at all extraordinary in German post-war experience. The, uh, the view uh, on whether it can be avoided is this. Uh, this is a sort of the view that my friend Hans Werner Sinn has been arguing now, that Germany is on the verge of having a really big credit boom. And the reason, I hope this is correct, the reason for this is that the German banks are of course absolutely stuffed with cash, uh, in every possible way, I won't go into their reserve positions, which are unbelievable, but just deposits. And they really don't want to lend to anybody outside Germany, because they've worked out that all the people they lend to outside Germany, including Americans, British, Spanish, Irish, they're all crooks. So, <laughs> and by God, are they right. So, they, so they want to lend at home. And there is, therefore, a tremendous effort, he tells me, by German banks to persuade German people to borrow in one way or another. And it is going to be a very interesting question to see whether that resistance will be overcome. In addition to that, of course, German industry is doing very well. It's very profitable. The German trades unions have noticed this. They've had a very long period, a very long period, of essentially zero real wage growth. They've accepted that as the price of making Germany competitive, and they want some of this. So if you're optimistic, uh, though I suspect that might not be how it feels to a German policymaker, we're going to see over the next 10 years a massive, wonderful credit plus real wage boom in Germany, and it will solve the problem. Or it will, no, it won't solve the problem, but it will be an important component. That plus a weak euro, which the European Central Bank will do its best to deliver. Unfortunately, they're competing with the Fed, which is doing its best to deliver the same thing. And it's not clear to me that the European Central Bank is necessarily more determined than the Fed to weaken its currency. We have a microphone in the middle of the room, and we have floating microphone up here. So uh, if there are questions, yes, sir. The, 
please. Paula uh, Haverlish from the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, I think uh, it really is very stimulating and mostly convincing. Uh, but uh, it has been said that the uh, best, the argument that I am most convinced by is the one that I heard last. Uh, in any event, uh, I have one important uh, question to ask you, what I think is important, it ties to what you just said about uh, German uh, society. You didn't mention explicitly, although you hinted at it, that the euro is a child of the European Union, which itself is, was originally uh, motivated mainly by not the economic benefits thereof, but uh, finding a way to overcome these centuries of uh, struggles and wars. That has so far not been brought up as an issue very much or as an argument for doing all we can. Uh, it, and it matters a great deal. Now, it may not matter on the technicalities of what is the economic mechanism of adjustment that it has to go through. I would agree fully that uh, it means for these countries no, basically no other way than a big depression. And by the way, there's a tiny example of Latvia, which is outside, but because of a fix has similar problems to Greece or something, which showed that economically it's, it's not that difficult and it doesn't take that long. But the connection with the original motivation, is there a time at which the things will become so difficult politically and so important economically to, to, to make the EU survive by making the euro survive, that this argument will begin to be made, let's say, on the German street, that look, if we give up the euro, we have to worry about giving up the EU, and it's not only economic benefits that it has provided us. I, but that was what I was referring to when I said that the costs have break up, up are profoundly, geopolit profoundly political and, uh, and that it would put in question uh, the achievements. Uh, nobody knows what would happen if it were to dissolve. Legally, it's impossible. It would, everybody, anybody who did this would be breaking the treaties. Now, Sweden is in violation of the treaties at the moment, so nobody seems to worry about this too much. But it would be rather different if it were a core country. So uh, the political risks associated with this are enormous. Uh, you know, if I were to view this as an economic, purely economic structure, purely, there were no politics, I would say that its breakup is certain. So the 50-50 is because it's not, it's a political project. Uh, it's a political project. And the political project is a very, very profound one. Many, it's, it doesn't need to be said in secretly, many Germans say, and many people in other countries say, that the maintaining, maintaining the euro is a matter of maintaining uh, Europe. Uh, actually, Nicolas Sarkozy said that, among many others. And, uh, and Hollande, I think, will feel exactly the same way. I, don't, I wrote a column recently which said that the political will to make this work should not be underestimated. Uh, and and it's for that reason that I think there is a very significant chance that it can be made to work. But it's going to be, a, what I wanted to stress, is that this is going to be a long process and there will be lots of crises along the way. And the difficulty with that is that in every one of these meetings which associated with the crisis, I think they've had, somebody told me they have had 17 or 18 summits in the last two years, something like that, to handle this. There's always the risk that in any one of these, at two, four in the morning, an utterly exhausted leader says, enough, I can't bear this anymore, out. And that's how catastrophes start. Look at your history. Um, we have a relatively little amount of time, and I see that we already have a, a, a veritable murderer's very, row very lined, up, lined up here. So please make your questions concise. Why don't we take three questions as a group, and uh, you can respond. Okay. Bert Ely. Um, Bert Ely, a banking consultant here in Washington. Um, as I look at the uh, euro, I've long thought that it really is fundamentally the, uh, the same as uh, a classical gold standard. And uh, when we take a look at what the history of the gold standards are, they ultimately all fail. Why should we think that this, the today's gold standard, the euro, is going to come to any different fate than uh, the classical gold standards of the past? Okay. Angel Ubi, the Tudor Investment and Peterson Institute. Oh, Martin, 
until you started putting the charts up there, I thought you were talking about the UK and not the Euro area. <laughs> because you were basically talking about an economy with imbalances, fiscal deficits, a financial sector that got in trouble. Then what experience has shown is that the advantage of having a, your own central bank and your own currency helps you to nothing. Because the performance of the UK since 2009 has been essentially as bad as in Spain or on the average of the Euro area. So what are we learning from that experience? Are we learning that when you have a structural problem, you have a structural problem, and there is very little that monetary and currency policies can do, and so you just have to wait and solve the problem? And second, what's the future of the UK, given that it seems to be tied to the euro area, and given the exposure that you have given us on the euro area is about to break up? What is the UK going to do about that when that time comes? Thank you. Um, Nicolas Veron at the Institute here and at Bruggen in Brussels. Uh, my question is also uh, about the UK, but it's a slightly different question. You said that uh, we would have to see a eurozonization of the banking system, if I remember the uh, uh, vocabulary well. Um, and the question is how this squares with the single market and how uh, the UK will. Um, manage its relationship with a unified banking union in the Eurozone if, of course, assuming uh, this happens. How do you see the EU banking policy going forward under that particular assumption? Thank you. Why don't we? Okay. Um, I was not asked to speak about the UK. I'm very happy to give a lecture of uh, the same length on the state of the UK economy, and you can read my column tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> It is a gold standard with one important exception, and it is so important that it shouldn't be ignored, which is that it has a central bank. It's a shared central bank. There is a profound reciprocal commitment inherent in that central bank. If it had been a classical gold standard, it would have looked a bit like the early 30s, and I would guess that it would have gone. But in fact, there turned out to be an enormous flow of uh, free credit, uh, not free, uh, actually relatively expensive, but manageably, exp uh, manageably cheap credit, some of it very cheap from the central bank or within the central bank, and that allowed it to survive and gives it uh, time to adjust. And I think that institution, which is the one genuine Eurozone institution, is unbelievably important. And it's only relatively recently that people outside a few specialists have begun to understand how important it is. Um, well, I would say, I'm sorry to say this, but the difference between having a government able to borrow at 7% or 6% and one able to borrow at 2% is really quite important in terms of your freedom of maneuver. So I wouldn't want to change with Spain. Uh, now, and I suspect you wouldn't mind having the 2% rates. In other words, uh, the difference is that the UK has relevant sovereignty, and that gives it a great deal of room for manoeuvre which doesn't depend on the say-so of other states. That matters to me, may not matter to you. Uh, it's why I wanted us to stay out. Uh, to put it very, very crudely, and I hope this will not be taken in any way invidiously, but the idea that, um, to put it, let's suppose we'd been in, let us suppose we were in a situation in which the German Chancellor told the British Prime Minister how to run his fiscal affairs. How long do you think this would have gone on for? Not very long. So the, uh, the, the, these differences are crucial if you care about sovereignty at all. But I would also point out that partly because of being able to cushion this in different ways and run a huge deficit very easily and tighten it relatively slowly, our unemployment rate is only 8%. That's quite a big difference. Um, uh, the final uh, question by Nicola is a really important question. Uh, when in 97 I wrote a column, uh, I wrote three columns actually, which I, two columns, in which I said, look, this is going to happen. <laughs> and it's pr if it's going to succeed, if it's going to succeed, then Britain will find itself in a position in which it's either in the Eurozone or it's out of the EU. And I remain of that view. Subsequently, I came to the view, if that's the choice, I'd rather be out of the EU. 
That's my personal choice. I believe it's the choice of Britain. It may be a catastrophe for Britain. I have no idea. It may be the end of Britain as a functioning entity. We may break up into four bits. Anything can happen. It's completely unpredictable. But if that's my choice, I'd rather be outside it. That's just my choice. But it is clear that if the Eurozone successfully moves towards being a stronger federal entity with a stronger political center, which I do think is a necessary condition for successfully managing the crisis, then the relationship with the UK may break. Uh, uh, the alternative may be that it works so wonderfully that it is so successfully integrated and not on the basis of domination by one country. Let's be very clear about that but as a genuine political unity, that in future the four component parts of the UK will decide that they will join as the four component parts, and that will be a different history. That's a choice that could very well arrive. It seems to me clear that the relationship of the UK with the rest of the EU will be fundamentally transformed <coughs> now, whatever happens, whether it breaks or whether it resolves the crisis, because the status quo in the Eurozone is not sustainable, and therefore the status quo in our relationship with the EU is not going to be sustainable. And at the moment, I think the best policy for the UK is to wait and see, very classical, uh, don't, don't exercise your options when there are still options, see what happens, try to manage our own affairs much better than we have, I agree completely with the question on that, and then some years from now, this might be a very different set of issues for the British government. The good rule of British politics is don't make a decision before you have to. Uh, please. Martin, is it, as someone who comes from Holland, I was intrigued. Identify yourself. Oh, sorry, Antoine, Antoine van Hakmel, Ashmore EMM. Um, is it, Coming from Holland, I was intrigued by how often you mentioned Holland next to Germany, for very logical and good reasons. But I was also surprised by how little you mentioned Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, uh, well, Finland once, uh, Norway, who are competitive economies that are functioning, that are neighbors with important trading relations. What do you see as their role? Because they must have a role. Well, the reason I didn't mention them is that I have far too many countries already, and there were far too many things to discuss, and they are not members of the Eurozone. Though Denmark is almost, so we could have included Denmark, uh, because it has had a fixed relationship uh, for so long. Uh, I think your answer, the answer I would give, is that the experience of these countries shows, as I argued back in the early 90s, when I argued for our not joining, that... Uh, a well-managed uh, uh, countries with functioning economic systems and functioning political systems which are small and have adjustable exchange rates can do rather well without joining the euro. Because there was a huge argument at that stage that anybody that was outside it would lose such enormous efficiency benefits of various kinds that they would become a backwater. And that was very much an argument in the UK. I think we can safely say, looking at the experience of these countries, that those fears were wrong. And that would justify my view that it was not the, necessarily the best possible thing to create the euro. But uh, I think these countries, so long as the Eurozone functions, and therefore the Europe, Europe functions as an economic system, all seem to me to be in great shape. Uh, I didn't go into the Latvian case, by the way, which you mentioned. I, will make one, I shouldn't do this, but I'll mention a story to you, which will amuse you and is relevant. Uh, last September, I went to Italy to talk to a very senior official. In this case, I won't indicate who it was, um, but had an important role. Uh, and it was clear that he was then thinking about exit. That was quite a shock to me. And, and he said to me, these people, they think we are Latvia. We are not Latvia. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we are approaching the witching hour, so let me uh, abuse my privilege of being the co-host here to ask the final question. Oh, dear. You ended your, uh, your presentation with a description of a short run that is five to ten years long that involves profound downturns, and you mentioned in passing youth unemployment in some of these countries at 25 to 50 percent. What do you think the likelihood is 
of the rise of serious mass politically radical movements in these countries. And if that were to occur, given the sort of multinational aspect of this whole program, what would be the effect on the governance of the European Union? I think in, it's probably the biggest question. And since I'm not a political scientist, I'm going to largely to duck it. But, the, but I'll make two points, or three points. First, um, I've tended to be moderately optimistic about this. Um, for two reasons. One, European countries are very old. There are, the youth unemployment is very high, but there aren't many youth. And, <laughs> and though parents care about them, you, can't, you don't start a revolution with 60-year-olds, is my theory. They're conservative. And though their benefits may be cut, they're still not going to overturn governments. And it's not 1848, in other words. Demographically, we're not 1848. And secondly, a very large part of the elites, political, economic, and social, in all European countries, are deeply and totally invested in the European project. And they sustain that through the political parties, the business interests, and so forth. These are incredibly powerful conservative forces. Beyond that, I would stress that, and that's my second major point, that all major European countries have had experiences which are still living memories, though fading, of total political catastrophe brought about by extremism. In some cases, this was war. In some cases, of course, it was civil war. Uh, in some cases, it was both. Uh, and people aren't that stupid. They know this. And finally, we are seeing signs, of course, of extreme parties emerging. Look at the vote for Marine Le Pen in the presidential election. Uh, uh, look at what's happening in the Netherlands. I'm sorry, come back to the Netherlands, which has been very remarkable in populist parties. But they have come nowhere near getting the sort of vote shares that it needed to get close to power. And I think if they did, all the other parties would unite against them. All the other parties would unite against them. And so you would never have the situation, famously in 33, when essentially the German Conservatives allowed uh, Hitler in, though he'd actually only won a third of the vote. Um, so uh, I am moderately optimistic, and that's why I'm moderately optimistic it through, that political stability can be sustained despite these very, very depressing circumstances. And in addition, by the way, a lot of the brightest and most able young people, and this is a tragedy, it's actually real, you can read it in the papers now, that a lot of the brightest and most talented younger people will simply leave and go elsewhere. That will uh, threaten these countries with long-term implosion, but it doesn't lead to political instability. My concern in the end, if it survives, is more that quite a number of countries um, might actually effectively not turn out to function in the future. But I think the fear of uh, it, voter instability is, under, is not that great. And I'll just make the final comment. The most important country by far, of course, is Germany. And I think this is very important in the optimistic view that it, it will be fixed. Fringe parties have done consistently very, very badly in Germany through all the ups and downs since the war, for God knows understandable reasons. And the, and the centrist parties, the Christian Democrats, uh, the Free Democrats on a good day, the SPD and the Greens are all overwhelmingly pro-European. In fact, if you had a grand coalition, uh, which I had sort of expected Angela Merkel for our chancellor to go for, uh, they could pass through euro bonds tomorrow. Um, so the political will at the core of the political systems in Europe must not be underestimated, and the danger from extreme forces must not be exaggerated. Uh, I may turn out to be, uh, I've ventured into hugely over-optimistic, but I am reasonably optimistic that the centre will hold in Europe, uh, in these, even in these very stressful times. In fact, I'm going to be, end up with a... Bob, I'm more optimistic in this regard about Europe than America. Oh. Ed, I was, 
I was about to say that I managed to extract something optimistic out of Martin, but that uh, last comment at the end, I may have to retract that. Would you like to make any final comments? No, I think, uh, I think we could wrap this up. Thank you all for well, coming. Well, thank you very much on behalf of the Peterson Institute and the National Economist Club. Um, thank you most of all to our guest, Martin Moore. The full presentation with all the notes and everything will be up somewhere or other. Peterson, if anybody's interested, and, and, the, and the pretty pictures. Thank you, Martin.